faith in the living kingdom and the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. And let us pray, O God, and just instruct the hearts of thy people by the light of the Holy Ghost, grant that in that same spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. During the course of Lent, I have been giving um, small thoughts in the morning masses about the Passion of Our Lord. And I left off at the crowning with thorns. And so I'd like to pick up from there and give a few thoughts. I don't know if it'll last an hour or if it will last a couple hours. I don't know yet, but we'll see. Um, Continuing on along the Passion. So after our Lord was crowned with thorns and the soldiers had mocked him by beating his head, spitting in his face and making fake reverences as if he was a king, they brought him out to Pilate. Now Pilate had unjustly condemned him to be scourged. And yet, he was uh, astonished at the state in which our Lord had been uh, left. He was wounds from head to feet, his head crowned with thorns. He could barely walk. He was in a state of shock. And they had placed his garments back on him. And Pilate brings him out to the balcony where the mob is below. And he is so shocked at the state in which our Lord had found himself that, or rather that he had found our Lord, that he was sure that he would find mercy among this crowd. And he stands our Lord in front of the crowd and he says two words. He says, Ecce homo. Behold the man. Those words are, are very profound. Behold the man. He, he is all man. He is strong. He is uh, powerful. And yet, look what we have done to him. Uh, behold him. What do you think of him? And he was sure that even the coldest heart would be moved to pity, seeing our Lord torn to shreds and, and barely able to stand. And without skipping a beat, the crowd says, crucify him. Pilate couldn't imagine why they would say crucify him, and yet they do. They say crucify him. It doesn't really make sense that there is no mercy in this huge crowd. And nevertheless, we can think of our own souls and our own times when we commit deliberate mortal sins. And we know that what we are about to do causes our Lord pain. Or better than the deliberate mortal sins, the sins of presumption. The sins of presumption where we think to ourselves, well, I'm going to go to confession anyway, and I'm going to, to say that I, commit, I committed this sin twice. Why don't I just go ahead and commit it three times? And I'll just say I committed it three times instead of twice. 
And we don't think anything of it. We think, well, I'm going to be forgiven anyway. But what is happening here? Well, by our sins, which we had already committed, we had scourged our Lord and left him for dead. And then, without skipping a beat, we're so prompt to say, crucify him. We don't care if we commit another sin. We're going to have it forgiven anyway. The sin of presumption. So Pilate is, is, is struck by these people saying, crucify him. And, and he says, well, why? Why do you want to crucify him? What evil has he done? And one of the priests shouts out, we have a law. And according to this law, this man should die because he, being a man, makes himself God. For the Jews, it would be difficult for them to understand how a mortal man could be God. But for the Romans, it was a different story. For the Romans, Caesar was God, and he was a mortal man. For the Romans, there were many gods. Seeing another god is a walk in the park for them. And so immediately, when Pilate hears this, he believes. What have I done? I've just scourged and, and crowned this, this god with a crown of thorns, and I've got God right in front of me here. Now what am I going to do? He believes immediately. And he is struck with fear. And he calls, up, calls our Lord into his, um, his hole again and starts asking him questions. He's starting to put two and two together. Well, yes, my wife had this dream not to mess with this man. Of course, he's God. And now what have I done? And he starts to ask our Lord questions, and our Lord is silent. It's one of those times when you know that what you're going to say is not going to be received, so why should you say it anyway? Our Lord is silent. And Pilate urges him to speak. And when our Lord does speak, he says, you would have no power unless it were given to you from above. Now Pilate is really scared. He's got God in front of him. And so he's, he's really scared. He goes out and he tells the people, I'm, I'm going to let him go. I mean, what have I done? I don't want to incur the wrath of God. And... Again, the priests speak up and they say, if you release this man, you are not a friend of Caesar. This is an interesting situation in which Pilate finds himself. He knows he has God in front of him. And yet he doesn't want to lose his friendship with Caesar. This is a classic example of human respect. He knows full well that what he's about to do is tragic. And yet, he is faced with human respect and what a human might think of him. And so he bends and he crucifies God in order to keep a human friendship, knowing full well what he's doing. You know, human respect never wins. You always lose the grace of God, and you end up losing the respect of your friends as well. Incidentally, a few years after this incident, another revolution broke out, and Pilate lost his supposed friendship with Caesar, and he was outcast. He's one of the outcasts of the Roman Empire, and he ended up committing suicide failure. So much for his human respect. And so Pilate goes and he sits on his judgment seat.
A little while earlier, he had said something absolutely ridiculous. He said, I find no fault in him, therefore I will chastise him. Doesn't make sense at all. And again, he does something completely outrageous. He sits on his judgment seat. And he calls in someone with water and he washes his hands. And in taking water, he claims that he is innocent of the sin that he is about to commit. It's so absurd. It's almost like going to confession and confessing that you want to kill someone. And you intend to kill someone and expect the priest to give you absolution. The priest cannot give you absolution for a sin that you're about to do. Because you're not sorry for it. This is a false act of sorrow. And so he says, I, I'm innocent of this man's blood. Look you to it. And then the next words that he is about to say are so horrible that none of the evangelists record them. They all have a lot of detail about all the sufferings of our Lord went through, but these words, so horrible, that none of them record them. He starts by saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. Look you to it. And then he went on to say, let him be crucified. How many times have you committed a sin which you know is wrong, and yet you rationalize it and minusculize it and justify it until you finally convince yourself that maybe it's not so bad, and then you go ahead and commit it anyway? Something so hideous. Let him be crucified. And then comes a very special moment in the life of our Lord. They present him with the cross. Some historians seem to think that he just had a, a beam that he carried. I don't think that's correct. I believe that no matter what historians say, that our Lord carried the whole cross to Calvary. And the reason why is because he lived his entire life for this moment. All his preaching was about carrying your cross. I'm sure when he was a child, he would play with pieces of wood, making little crosses and thinking of the future. And then when he came to preach, he would preach about it so often. He who cannot take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And I, if I be left, lifted up, will draw all things to myself. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, who am meek and humble of heart. For my yoke is sweet, and my burden light. This was the moment he had always been waiting for, his entire life. Archbishop Fulton Sheen would say that the shadow of the cross spread over the entire life of our Lord. And his entire life, he thought about this moment when he would receive his cross. They say that St. Andrew, when St. Andrew was presented with the cross on which he would die, he, he worshipped it, and for joy he exclaimed, O blessed cross, receive the disciple of him who hung upon thee, my master Christ. How much greater must have been the joy of our Lord when he saw this cross? It was almost like a soldier receiving that sword for the first time and he pulls it out of the sheath and he looks at it and he sees how it gleams and he thinks this is what's going to give me the victory and he admires it and he likes how it makes that sound when he puts it back into the sheath. That must have been this moment for our Lord when he sees this glorious wood, which will be what he will use for our salvation. This will be his instrument that he will use to conquer Satan 
to open the gates of heaven. And even though he is suffering and he is in pain, excruciating pain, and he can barely stand, yet he embraces and he loves this cross, this, this instrument, this trophy of his victory. And so he places it on his battered shoulders and he sits out. But you'll notice that the third station, he falls. Right after, right after he receives his cross, he is crushed by its weight. And he falls to the ground. How differently do we act when we receive a cross? When we, are, are play, uh, when we receive a cross, the first thing we say is, why me? Why does it have to happen to me? Why does God hate me? Why did God do this to me? And then we, we, we're crushed by its weight, even though, what does it weigh compared to the cross that our Lord had? These little splinters that we carry, we complain about. When his cross weighed more than all of our little measly splinters put together. And we begin to curse God and we stop praying and why do I even care about God anymore? Why should I go to church? Look what he's done to me. I'm infuriated. And then we hate the fact that God loves us. Well, if God loves me and gives me this cross, why does he love me? Our divine master is crushed under the weight of his cross, and yet he doesn't stay crushed on the floor. He gets up and he continues on without a whimper, without a complaint, without cursing God. He continues on. And unlike us who complain that God supposedly loves us and so he gives us a cross, our Lord continues on because he loves us. He's carrying this cross because he loves you. Along the way of the cross, we find an interesting character, Simon of Cyrene. They were looking for someone who was completely out of the picture, not interested in our Lord's suffering, a stranger, someone walking by. And, and they grab him, and they say, you're going to carry the cross. And he has his two kids with him and tells his two kids to, to go away. And he carries this cross with our Lord. You've all been in a situation where you have something heavy to carry and when someone helps you, it actually makes it a little more difficult. Because you've got this big thing you're trying to carry and, and someone helps you and, it, and you're pulling it this way and that way and it makes it more difficult. And Simon didn't carry the entire cross. He only carried part of it, and he carried it unwillingly. So in other words, he's trying to get out of it. He was very little help to our Lord. So much so that our Lord fell twice while Simon was supposed to be helping him. And yet our Lord uses this opportunity to save his soul. Our Lord once told his apostles that not by uh, that, that he has food 
which they do not understand. He is uh, revived by saving souls. And you see it several times during his life. You see it with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. And he's thirsty when he starts speaking to her. The first thing he says is, give me something to drink. And yet, as the conversation goes on, he completely forgets about being thirsty. The apostles come and they say, Master, I've got, we've got food for you. Why don't you eat? And he completely forgets about the food. He's completely revived by this opportunity to save a soul. Then in the court of Pilate, we see the same thing, that everybody's trying to condemn him to death. He couldn't care less about the accusations that they say. His only one concern is trying to save Pilate's soul. Here is an opportunity of grace. And he's going to give it everything he's got to save Pilate's soul. And then on the cross, even though he is suffering tremendously on the cross, he still finds the opportunity to save one of the thieves with, with whom he is crucified. And so our Lord is nourished by this opportunity to save a soul, and he saves Simon's soul, not by words, but by his actions. Simon begins to carry the cross, Little by little, just by our Lord's actions, he sees that this indeed is God. By our Lord's meekness, by our Lord's patience, enduring buffets, enduring mockery, telling the women not to weep for him, he'll be okay, weep for themselves. And little by little, Simon starts to see that our Lord is innocent. He starts to realize that, you know what, I'm carrying part of this cross, but actually I should be carrying the whole thing. Everybody here should be carrying the whole thing. We should all be crucified because he is innocent and he is dying for us. As the high priest said, it's expedient that one man die, lest we all perish. And so by the time they get to Calvary, Simon had been converted. He becomes a Christian. And his two sons, uh, Alexander and Rufus, become bishops in the early church. And eventually they're all martyred. We also have another person, Veronica. And she comes and she wipes the face of our Lord with her veil. A very small act, yet it's full of love, full of care. In a way, we see the two types of vocations, of religious vocations in these two people. We see the active vocations in Simon, who actively helps our Lord to carry his cross. And we see the contemplative vocations in Veronica, those, those nuns and those, those monks who pray. And we might think that they have an easy life. They don't have any worries or cares or concerns. They just pray, get up in the morning, pray, go to sleep. And yet it's vital. It's so important. The act that Veronica does to wipe our Lord's face is so small, so insignificant. I mean, his face is going to get dirty again moments after she wipes it. And yet, our Lord doesn't consider it insignificant at all. Instead, he rewards her with an incredible relic, with the image of his face on her veil. And 
It's no small thing because of her love, because of her devotion. And the same thing, contemplative vocations are what keeps the church holy. It's contemplative vocations that, that beg God for the graces that we need on a daily basis. Contemplative vocations are the ones that pray for the conversion of sinners. And even though it seems that they do nothing without prayer, we'll all dry up. The whole church will dry up like an ocean without water. There is another encounter on the way to Calvary. That is the encounter of Our Lady. It's no words can really describe this meeting. Tradition has it that Our Lady was there for our Lord's entire suffering. She was there when, when he was scourged, that she was there when they condemned him. And there's this opportunity on the way of the cross to, to meet, for the two of them to meet. Now Lady suffered incredibly in her soul. All the sufferings that our Lord endured. A mother suffers an awful lot more than her child. If her child falls and breaks something. The mother feels that pain. If the child leaves the faith, the child will think there's nothing wrong. If a child quits going to church or lives a life of sin, the child thinks they're happy. But it's the parent who suffers in, in, in many sleepless nights and prays and does penances, and waits, and realizes the full depth of the pain, or, or the full depth of the situation, which the child doesn't feel anything. The parent always suffers more than the child. And our Blessed Mother sees our Lord, and she suffers maybe even more than he does. All these acts of disrespect to our Lord, the spitting, buffets, mockery, he wouldn't suffer those acts of disrespect half as much as Our Lady would, because he's humble. And he, he wouldn't uh, feel that outrage as much as Our Lady who knows he is God, who knows how he should be respected and who feels that pain in her soul when she sees him treated that way. And all the scourging, the loss of blood, our Lord feels it physically, but she feels it so much more spiritually in her heart. And while she feels this pain, she, she knows why our Lord is doing it. And she unites her heart to that reason. She wants to help him. She's almost like the first victim soul who unites her heart and unites her sufferings to our Lord so that she can help him uh, with, this, with this act of, of saving us and, and opening heaven for us. They finally arrive at Golgotha. And there's a small incident that happens. It's only recorded in one of the Gospels. That they offer him wine mixed with gall. And only one of the Gospels mentions that he tastes it and then he doesn't drink it. The other Gospels all say that he, he refuses it. 
I'm kind of impressed by that little incident. What it is, because the sufferings of the nailing to the cross and, and hanging from the cross is so painful, usually they would have this drink that they would offer to the, the criminal. And that drink would, would kind of kill the pain, make them not as lucid and, and help them kill the pain. And usually they would drink quite a lot of it. And then they would be in a state that they wouldn't feel it, kind of like what the dentist does to you before he starts drilling your teeth. And they offer it to our Lord, and our Lord takes it to his lips and, and just barely touches it to his lips. And then he gives it back to them. In other words, it's an act of gratitude. He recognizes the fact that they want to show him an act of charity. And instead of saying, no, I'm holier than that, I don't want this because I'm going to suffer, he takes it as an act of gratitude and he recognizes their charity. And in a way, he's saying, thank you. Thank you for showing me this, this little act of charity and um, I'll accept it. And yet he doesn't drink much at all. He actually just touches it to his lips because he does want to suffer as much as he can for us. But we see in this little act, the, an act of humility, act of gratitude. Then he is stripped of his garments. He had been scourged several hours before. And so all these wounds in his body had crystallized onto his garments. And by stripping his garments, all these wounds are reopened. We all know what it's like to have a band-aid pulled off and, and uh, not enjoy that. But imagine your entire body like that. It would have sent his whole body into a state of shock again. And not only is it a an instant state of shock over his entire body, but it's also a, a humiliation. Here he is in front of a large crowd of everybody who hates him, and there he has to stand naked in front of all these people who hate him. It's a tremendous act of humility, a humiliation, ridicule in front of a mocking crowd who are no longer wowed by his power and his miracles, but see him battered, barely able to stand, and naked. So it's a renewed act of pain, it's a humiliation, and it's also a token of poverty, that our Divine Master entered into this world in a stable, on a bed of straw, with nothing. And just as he enters with nothing, he also now leaves the world with nothing. He's buried in a stranger's tomb. They cast lots and divide his clothes among them. He has nothing. It's all taken away. Then we have the nailing to the cross. When Mel Gibson's passion movie came out, one of the news stories was that somebody actually died watching the nailing to the cross. So intense was, was that pain. And it is intense. It could be one of the most painful moments of the Passion. You know, when they have prisoners, they, they tie them up and they drag them here and they drag them there. And our Lord had been chained from the very beginning. But at this moment, there's no chains. They'd taken his chains off, stripped him of his clothes. He's standing there. 
And then they say, okay, now lay down on the cross. He lays down. Now give me your right hand. Gives him his right hand. Now give me your left hand. Gives him his left hand. Now give me your feet. And all the while, they're, they're jamming him with, with steel and pain. And, and he doesn't say anything. But he also obeys. Promptly. They don't have to chase him back down the hill before they put him on the cross. They don't have to fight with him. He freely lays on the cross. He freely gives his hands. He freely gives his feet. All the while in the most excruciating pain. And how often it is that we obey willingly. If we obey willingly, it's usually because we agree with what we've been asked to do. But how difficult is it for us to do something we don't want to do? How difficult is it for us to, to do something that might cause us pain? And yet he does. And then they raise the cross. The cross goes up with ropes and it kind of sways a bit as it's getting air. And then it gets kind of dragged over to where the hole is and then there's a thump and it goes into that hole. And when that thump happens, the pain is excruciating. Those nails, they just get all pulled really hard all at once. And, and his head probably bangs against the cross and his crown of thorns. And the, the wounds from the scourging all ripped up against the jagged wood and splinters. The pain's excruciating. And at that moment, they, they say, is, is when thieves or criminals on the cross do the most outrageous stuff. They scream, they curse God, and they and spit on people, and so on. And what does our Lord do at that moment? Right at that moment, when it's the most painful part of the crucifixion, he exclaims, but he doesn't exclaim out of pain. He exclaims, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Forgive them. After all that he's been through, after all that he's suffered, at the hands of, of, of this mob, he prays for forgiveness. We can look at this last day of our Lord's life, and we can see in there every virtue. We can see in there every sin that we have committed in that mob. If our Lord had done nothing throughout his entire life to preach the gospel, that sermon that he gave on his last day would have been enough. Holy Week is one of the saddest weeks of the year because we commemorate our Lord's sufferings. I do not know why, but ironically, the liturgy is the most beautiful liturgy of the year. The chants of the Gregorian chant are some of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful chants that the church has. In fact, my, my favorite chant would be the, the Christus Factus Es Nobis in Tenebrae. It's just so astoundingly beautiful when they turned off all the lights of the church and it's in complete darkness and then the monks start singing Christus Factus Es Pro and it's just so breathtakingly beautiful.
The same thing about the prayers. The prayers of the liturgy in these days are just so beautiful, so full of meaning, so intense, so rich. And it's kind of sad because we don't really have the opportunity to preach during these liturgies, but there's really nothing more to say. If you can follow the prayers and see what's being sung by the choir and what the priest is saying, it doesn't match. The, the, the prayers, they don't match anything else the rest of the year. One of my favorite, favorite's the wrong word to use, but you know what I'm trying to say, are the verses that are sung during the veneration of the cross. They're so profound that they hurt. And our Lord is speaking as God, and he is saying to the people, I gave you all this, and you gave me this. My people, what have I done unto thee? Or in what have I offended thee? Answer me. I led thee out of Egypt, having drowned Pharaoh in the Red Sea, and thou hast delivered me up to the chief priests. I opened the sea before thee, and thou hast opened my side for the lance. I went before thee in a pillar of cloud, and thou hast brought me to the court of Pilate. I fed thee with manna in the desert. And thou hast smitten me with heavy blows, and hast scourged me. I gave thee wholesome water to drink out of a rock, and thou hast brought me gall and vinegar in my thirst. For thy sake I struck down the kings of Canaan, and thou hast struck me on the head with a reed. I gave thee a royal scepter, and thou hast given my head a crown of thorns. The prayer is just amazingly beautiful. It goes on, and, and it's really a dagger that really hits us, that he gave us so much, and what have we given him? But you know, we can kind of hide behind this prayer. It's like one of those sermons that's not preached to you, because you could say, well, I wasn't there when uh, you parted the sea, and I wasn't there when they said crucify him. Crucify him. And you can kind of hide behind someone else and say, oh, well, it stinks to be those people because, I mean, look what they did. But you know, it's, it's much worse. Much worse. Because all this that our Lord suffered is because of your sins. If there had have been only one person in the world who had a sin, and if that person had have only sinned once, our Lord would have suffered all the same. What you do to God with one sin is nothing compared to all the sufferings that our Lord endured for you. And so the scourging for you, the crown of thorns for you, the carrying of the cross for you, you personally, the nailing, All for you. And at the same time as our Lord is suffering all this for you, He is giving you the most amazing gifts. Gifts that make us wonder what, what we did to deserve them. And it's gift after gift. <coughs> after gift. And when you think that God couldn't possibly give you something more or something better, He surprises you. And so we all know that He died on the cross to open the gates of heaven for us. If He had only done that, it's a home free. What else do we need? But that's not all He did. Because there, hanging on the cross, after he had opened the gates of heaven for us, he gives us his mother to be our mother. The 
Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. You know, I'm sure Our Lady did not appreciate that. I'm sure she did not appreciate after she was about to retire to be dumped with all of us sinners and have to be our mother. And then to know that for the rest of eternity, we'd be bugging her. Hey, can you give us this? Hey, can you give us that? But she accepted. She's our mother. She went to work right away, bringing in the apostles, making sure they stayed, making sure they were there for the Holy Ghost, making sure they began to preach the gospel throughout the world. But that's not all that Christ gave us on that day. The night before, he gave us the holy sacrifice of the Mass, which would be this, this replay of Calvary for us every single day. So that those of us until the end of the world who could not be there on Calvary could be there in person at Mass. This culmination of all our belief, of the Scripture, of the Catechism, of, our, of articles of faith, of how we worship, of angels, of Old Testament, New Testament. Everything combined into this marvel of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And He gave it to us. If He had have given us that alone, even without the crucifixion, that would have been amazing, enough to save us. And that wasn't all, because he also gave us the Eucharist. Those of us who, who couldn't be there when he was healing the sick, who couldn't be there when he was feeding the multitudes, who couldn't be there to listen to the Beatitudes, who couldn't be there when he says, he'll rise again. We have that opportunity to be there, to walk down the street from our house and go to a building where he's there, waiting for us. Until the end of time. And it's never like you have to wait in line. You never have to take a number. You never have to, to, to wait for everybody else to finish. He's there for you, personally. And He comes into your heart at Holy Communion. And there He is in your heart, listening to anything you want to tell Him. Yours. Nobody else. Just you and He. Such an amazing gift our Divine Master gave us. And that's not all. Because on that night he also gave us the priesthood. The priests who could offer the sacrifice of the Mass for us. The priests who could tell us that God has forgiven us. To reassure us, you know, you're sorry for your sin. But God's going to forgive you. God has forgiven you. Go and sin no more. The priest who, when we're about to die, and we're scared, can tell us, you're going to be okay. You're good to go. So while we give our Lord our sins, and we scourge Him, and we crown Him with thorns, and we send him to the cross, and he suffers all this for us. He is giving us incredible gifts, things that people couldn't even imagine. And each one is greater than the other. And what do we do? Do we care? Do we keep sinning? Do we keep giving him more pain? So 
So you know, when you, when you do the Stations of the Cross, it's, it's okay to cry. In fact, we should do so much more. We should have a holy confusion in our hearts right now. This, this incredible confusion that's mixture of gratitude for all that Christ has given us and sorrow for all that we have given him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.